Yeah, this year uh, we raise creating the production curve and transitioning to NFT landscape. And it will be divided into four focus group discussion. So don't forget to attend this virtual conference and just go to the registration link as shown on bit.ly slash Yatmi Virtual Conference 2021 Regis. And before we go to the presentation session, let us hear the opening remarks from every representative. The first one from the Yatmi representative, Mr. Hadi Ismoyo. Mr. Hadi, time is yours. Thank you, Bintang. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Uh, first of all, I would like thank and appreciate to all the presenter, Pak Tom, Pak Marco, and also I would like appreciate to Pak Andri Sergar as a consul Republic Indonesia at Houston, and also Pak Bimo as Cardin USA, also to all of the team behind this activity, Pak Hendrikus team, and also Pak Bintang as a moderator. My name is Hathi Esmoyo as Secretary of General uh, Yatmi. What kind of the Yatmi? Let me introduce as Yatmi. Yatmi is uh, Indonesia Petroleum Society, basically it's like SPA in the local term of Indonesia. We have uh, 10,000 members across the country with the 14 brands in the uh, domestic and also overseas, most likely in the Middle East, Europe, uh, Central Asia, and also Southeast Asia, Australia, and also maybe some of them is in uh, USA. The very, very, very happy we have uh, kind of this topic Basically, uh, topic related with uh, transition energy is a very unique topic uh, because maybe we cannot just copy paste what kind of the strategy transition energy in the USA or Europe in Indonesia. Indonesia has a lot of uh, energy like uh, gas and geothermal, but, but right now it's not developed yet very aggressive because of the lack of the infrastructure of the gas and also lack of the policy of the geothermal. So the ge geothermal development is not massive that we expected. In the uh, energy mix uh, target, we will have the target 23% of the energy renewable in the 2020-25, but I don't think we can grab that even though some of the people said that we can have the solar panel massive program, but I don't think that this can catch up with 23%. So very happy that uh, Pak Marco, Tom, as an uh, expert on the energy transition, give us the tausia. Tausia's meaning is some kind of the uh, wisdom to us. How do we develop in the uh, uh, transition energy in the Indonesian style? not just copy-paste because it's just copy, Indonesia is a unique country. So don't just push, push copy-paste from, from your country to here, but at least see all the strength, strength uh, and weakness uh, 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 my country. Okay, before that, I have the three slides to introduce uh, what kind of the profile of the YATMI. Of course, the, 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 the objective of the YATMI is uh, to get the uh, increase and strengthen the uh, competency in the oil and gas professional. So uh, the next slide, I will introduce that uh, the regression profile. We have by John as a uh, uh, chairman of the IATB. Right now also he is sitting as a business development and planning director of the soap holding of Pertamina. Very strategic uh, position. And also we have uh, Dewan Penasihat Advisory Board uh, 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 led by Pak Profesor Tutuko Ariaji, right now sitting as a general oil and gas sector. And the next, we also have uh, 14th Commissariat, Commissariat's friend, 
uh, across the world. And also the next slide, I will show you that we also have the 19 student chapter. This is strength, strengthen our point that Yadmi also take care of the professional and also take care about the student. Okay, uh, not further ado, I will back to I will give it back to Pak Bintang and Selamat berseminar. I hope you can uh, everybody in here get something to learn about the energy transition special for Indonesia. Thank you very much. Okay, Bintang, it's yours. Thank you, Mr. Hadi. The next opening remarks come from the Consulate General of the Republic of Indonesia in Houston, the Honorable Mr. Andre Omer Siregar. Mr. Andre, time is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Peace and prosperity. Uh, yang terhormat Bapak Hadi Ismoyo, Sekjen of IATMI. Yang terhormat Bapak Jurgantono Surya Winata, President of the Society of Indonesian Energy Professionals, Houston CF. Yang terhormat Bapak Bimo Hadi Putro, President of AIS, I, uh, IACC. Uh, distinguished Speaker, Dr. Thomas Baker. Managing Director and Partner of the Boston Consulting Group, Dr. Marco Lashkovic, Partner of the BCG in Singapore, Distinguished Participants, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good morning, Selamat Pagi in Indonesia, and also good evening to participants in the US. So let me first of all congratulate you all for joining this event. Like Mahadi mentioned, it's an early Saturday morning on a long weekend uh, uh, for those who, uh, who are attending the Easter celebrations. Uh, and it's 8 p.m. in Friday night in Houston, uh, where many uh, folks are enjoying Friday night, but yet we're all here today at this event, uh, and it means that we have a common passion, a common view, and we are looking to the crystal ball of the future for potential energy collaboration. So let me congratulate you all uh, for participating in today's uh, activities. Um, I'd like to also thank Yatmi, CF, IICC, and Boston BCG for uh, in collaboration with my Consulate General uh, to organize this important event. This is the fourth IATMI talk with the theme Energy Transition Development in North America, Implications Toward Indonesia. I think the theme is very timely, so I'm delighted to hear the notable speakers from Dr. Tom Baker and Dr. Marco Lachkovic, uh, who will share recent developments on energy transition and development in Northern America and how it develops for Indonesia. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, as you note that today, um, the discussion on energy transition is a very timely theme. Uh, fossil fuel remains as an important source of energy, but slowly it is shifting away to renewables. Many countries are striving to pursue that endeavor, uh, and yet not, our, not all are successful. Just last week, I met with the government of um, uh, Alabama, and one thing that they uh, informed me was um, they're working very hard to be in the, in the, uh, ahead of the curve in progression, so that uh, as they grow significantly, uh, the new energy will be in line with what they expect to see in the coming decades. This discussion is relevant for that element, for that matter. Uh, since I'm based in the US, I'd like to also take note of the Petroleum Institute's effort last week, uh, leading oil and gas lobbying group that decided to support the idea of US government putting a price on carbon emission, provided that the governments would not impose other measures. I think that is a, a significant benefit and a, a way forward, a positive sign for regulatory to avoid regulatory duplication and also collaboration among countries and energy private sectors as a pursuit for innovation and technology is something that all of us are pursuing and something that the US and Indonesia uh, can surely share. We have the resources, you have the technology and you have the experience. And yet what will we see in the next coming decades? Before I continue, I just wanted to uh, point out that um, as, as we re read in the report of the McKinsey's of the world in 2050, uh, Indonesia is uh, expected to be the seventh largest economy by 2030. And, uh, and also the largest, the fourth largest economy by 2050, uh, just after China, the US, Japan, and, in, and, and Indonesia as the fourth. So when that happens, um, how does this discussion uh, be part of that preparation? Uh, what do we expect to see in the energy transitions? Uh, is Indonesia in the same direction as what the presenters will convey? Or even as Bahadi mentioned, uh, are we really too ambitious or are we only cut and paste other policies? And uh, what do we need to adapt our technologies uh, to make sure that we're in the right direction? And most importantly, what can the government do? Or in this regard, the Consulate General represent the government. What can we do to facilitate uh, those endeavors? Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think one point that I wish to, uh, to convey is that this discussion is extremely timely. 
uh, not only due to the new developments in attending to climate change challenges. Uh, the U.S. president has invited my president to attend the special summit on climate change. Uh, but more importantly, uh, how can Indonesia be a, a natural partner for the U.S.? Uh, no doubt your technology is far ahead of ours. And yet our ambition, as Pahadi says, our passion is high. And yet our technology still needs to be adjusted, yeah, Pahadi. In that regard, we need to leapfrog. We need to take uh, a, 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 a quantum leap, or if I may call it, we need to have an energy technology convergence. A convergence meeting that our leapfrog will be consistent with the targets that our American friends can work with. I'm sure that the skilled professionals in Indonesia are working very hard to uh, strive for this convergence, but the reality is there's much more to be done. And if our target by 2025 is 23%, as Pahadi mentioned, at least if we can't reach 23%, we can come, uh, we can leapfrog to a number that uh, uh, can maintain uh, our goal so that we'll reach 23% uh, within the coming decades. Ladies and gentlemen, one final thing. Um, my minister last week, uh, 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 earlier last month, attended the Sarah Week. And in that meeting, it was a great chance for us to uh, begin the discussion on what more can be done by governments and what more collaboration can be done between stakeholders and more importantly, the next generation. It is an important uh, element to highlight, as Hadi mentioned, the 19 representations of Indonesia are the future of our energy collaboration. It is my hope that this meeting will provide uh, the necessary uh, uh, um, hopes and beliefs to those uh, next generation. And I hope that this meeting will provide that um, inspiration. And rest assured, the Consulate General in Houston, uh, we will do our part to facilitate you. We will do our part to bring you to the relevant authorities. And in fact, we might even explore ways to have uh, more innovation so that in the next three years, we'll have a, a significant development in, uh, in however way uh, we can. Thank you very much, and I'm wishing you all the best in the discussions. Thank you, Mr. Andre, for the opening remarks. The next one from Society of Indonesian Energy Professional, SIEP Houston representative, Mr. Jurgen Tono Suryawinata. Mr. Tono, time is yours. Um, thank you, Bintang, for your third time. I promise to be brief, so let's see if I can do it in less than one minute. So basically, uh, I would like to say good morning and good evening for all. Thank you for spending your time attending this uh, webinar on ener um, energy transition. I, you know, like, just would like to say on behalf of Society of Indonesian Energy Professionals, we would like to thank uh, your honor, Bapak Andre Omer Segar, the Consul General of Republic Indonesia, for hosting and addressing this event, uh, also uh, for his staffs. And we would like to thank as well the team from Boston Consulting Group, um, Dr. Tom Baker, Dr. Uh, Marco Lakskovic for uh, sharing their expertise and willingness to serve in this event as a speaker. And a special shout as well to uh, our own Bapa Eddie Martono, Dr. Eddie Martono, uh, for connecting us with his uh, colleagues in BCG. Without him, this event will not be possible. Uh, and also would like to thank our partners in IATMI and IAACC for uh, their cooperation in hosting this event. Thank you. And I give the uh, form back to Pak Bintang. Thank you, Mr. Tono. The last one from Indonesian American Chamber of Commerce, IACC representative, Mr. Bimo Hadiputro. Mr. Bimo, time is yours. Thank you, Mas Bintang. I'm gonna try to beat that to be even less uh, uh, verbose. So, um, I, I'm gonna take a moment to just uh, say this, which is uh, one of the um, uh, uh, reflections and uh, benefits out of COVID is this, the fact that we can all connect uh, so easily uh, without so many barriers globally and almost at any time. So I, I think we should cherish this opportunity and hopefully when uh, uh, globally things return to normal, it will be a good foundation for us to meet uh, even more uh, intentionally on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, thank you, IATMI uh, team, Paadis uh, Moyo, Pa Enricus, and team for uh, uh, hosting this uh, wonderful event. Uh, to uh, my fellow um, uh, organization leaders, uh, as well as I want to also thank uh, the privilege of the time, your time, Pa Konjen, uh, Consul General Andre. 
uh, as well as uh, uh, the two distinguished speakers, uh, Dr. Tom and Dr. Uh, Marco. I'd like to make a shout out also to one participant, uh, a good friend of uh, ours, uh, Mr. Mario Simanjuntak, and uh, he represents uh, the uh, U.S. Commercial Service uh, as part of, I believe, the Department of Commerce, the U.S. Department of Commerce, uh, uh, based in the U.S. Embassy in Jakarta. Welcome, uh, Mas Mario, and thank you for the privilege of your time. So um, that's uh, basically it. Uh, without further delay, uh, I would like to uh, uh, not delay the uh, uh, venue any much longer and would like to hear from the experts in this field. Thank you for uh, the privilege of your time one more time. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bimo. Okay, now I will introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Mas Adnan, please help me to share screen. Okay, the first speaker is Dr. Tom Becker. He is a BCG Global Topic Leader for Distributed Energy Resources, or DER, and leader of green energy and environment sector in North America. He has extensive experience working clients in North America and globally on DER and renewables topic. He is managing director and partner based in San Francisco. Prior to BCG, he worked for First Solar. He holds a doctoral degree in physics from Harvard University. The second speaker is Dr. Marco Lakovic. He is a partner based in Singapore. He has extensive experience across power generation value chains and renewable space having worked with energy clients across different geographies, including Southeast Asia and Indonesia. He holds a doctoral degree in engineering and MBA from the University of Zagreb. Before we get, we get started, I'm going to go through some webinar rules to ensure the webinars run smoothly. First, any provocation or harassment related to ethnic, religion, race, or sexual content is prohibited. Second, participants are not allowed to turn on their mic and video during the webinar, except with permission from moderator. Third, it is prohibited to screen capture or record to respect the copyright. And any question can be written in the chat box. Moderator will gather all the question for, for the Q&A session. The participant can also directly ask a question in the Q&A session after permission from the moderator. Now, without further ado, I would like to welcome our first presenter, Dr. Tom Becker. Dr. Tom Becker, the screen is yours. Great, thank you. Um, well, first off, it's my absolute pleasure to join you all today. Um, it's so exciting to see the collaboration between um, the US and Indonesia. And um, as many of the uh, distinguished speakers had, had talked through you know, the importance of uh, the energy transition topic. Um, what I hope to do in, in my section before handing it off to Marco is provide a little bit of context of um, what we see, quite frankly, globally in terms of trends and uh, uh, factors that are driving the energy transition. And then um, I do, I know the interest is in um, learning a little bit more of what's happening in the U.S. And so uh, from there, I'll dive a bit into uh, from a renewable energy perspective uh, some of the key trends we're seeing in the U.S., both from a technology perspective and then also a, a business model perspective. Um, I think on behalf of both Marco and I, um, you know, we will try to keep our presentations uh, relatively short. We would much rather have an open dialogue and um, encourage everyone to uh, submit questions, and um, we'd, we'd love to make this more interactive. So with that, um, I'll, I'll dive in. Um, you know, this group knows incredibly well um, the what are the major drivers of, of the future of energy and, and the key drivers uh, impacting the energy transition. And, and quite frankly, as I teed up, I really do think these are global and in, in nature, whether it's starting at the top, the key implications of climate change and how policymakers, stakeholders, and our customers are um, thinking through the implications of climate change on policy, um, on regulation, on social license to operate. Um, in our view, that then drives, as you go uh, to the right, the, 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 the demand mix and how, um, whether it's customers or specific regulations and, or policies are driving a, a pretty um, instrumental change in the demand and energy that we see going forward. Now, of course, to meet that demand at the same time, we're seeing 
um, the resource mix and the supply mix shift, um, obviously with a focus on carbon intensity, um, obviously a, a focus on uh, scope one and two emissions to be more clean in, in our, our production in the oil and gas industry. And then finally, as you move around, all those have implications on our corporate strategy and how we think about allocating capital and how we engage with stakeholders. So uh, very clear, you've got these set of drivers going forward. If we take the next uh, double click down and jump to the next page, you know, in the work that we see here in the US and, um, and quite frankly, I think across the globe, there are a couple specific um, and, and more tactical implications that those trends on the previous uh, slide are creating. I won't cover uh, each one, um, but in the upper left, in one of the core to uh, topics for discussion today is the increasing penetration of utility scale renewables. Um, we see in the, in the US and across the globe, as a result of massive price and cost uh, reductions, um, utility scale renewables compete with coal, um, gas, and other technologies unsubsidized um, without, the, without the need for any subsidies. Um, and I'll, I'm happy to spend more time talking a, a bit more today about uh, what we're seeing specifically in the US. Um, on the right-hand side, another topic that's near and dear to my heart um, is the growth of distributed gener uh, uh, generation and what we call DER, or distributed energy resources. And this is a result of, again, declining renewable costs, but, but also um, rising power and energy costs at a customer level where we're seeing rooftop solar, distributed storage, um, EV charging, and the need to manage that uh, becoming an increasingly more um, important part of the energy mix and, um, and one that um, will, will be important going forward. I um, have many other technologies here on the page and, an import, and important drivers. I'll, I'll highlight one, one more before I leave the page and it's hidden in, in the middle on the left there, which is um, the, um, increasing role of battery storage. Um, as we ex continue to see an increased penetration of utility scale renewables, um, at, you know, as this group knows, the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. And um, as we get to increasing penetrations of uh, that intermittent renewables, there needs to be a need to, to balance that, uh, uh, balance that uh, intermittency and, um, uh, and, and balance the grid. Um, I think in my, in my view, fossil fuel um, is gonna be an important part of that. Um, and in fact, in many in respects in the US, gas is an enabler to, um, to increasing penetration of renewables, but so is battery storage, as we've seen um, massive declines in battery storage costs driven by both scale and experience and the growth of, uh, growth of EVs. So with that, I wanted to dive a little bit more specifically into the um, um, US. Um, Marco, I think what, we can skip this page in the, in the interest of time. Yeah, so um, you know, the, I wanted to talk specifically about the power sector uh, that I know well in the United States and um, talk through what are gonna be the major levers to reduce emissions um, consistent with a two degree Celsius path, uh, which is, um, as I'm sure this group knows, the, you know, the general uh, science-based agreement and uh, uh, codified in the Paris Agreement um, of the pathway needed to limit um, warming to, 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 to uh, two degrees. And what you'll see is um, moving from left to right, the, um, the likely set of uh, levers that we expect being pulled um, in the U.S. and and again, focus just on the just on the power sector. You know, of course, there are uh, industrial and transportation and other major um, emitters in in the U.S. And uh, by far, the biggest uh, category that you see there, and that I'll spend the rest of my time talking through, and I know as I'm interested in the group, is renewables. Um, and we're going to see renewables make up, you know, approximately 60, 70 percent of the total uh, reduction potential. Um, in, in the power sector in the US. Now that's gonna be paired with um, energy efficiency, uh, which is that uh, green box all the way to the left. We are gonna see a switch from coal to gas. And as I alluded to before, you know, this switch is cost effective 
helps enable renewables because it's uh, it, it's uh, a more flexible generation source and helps reduce emissions at the same time as um, as coal has a much uh, lower carbon intensity that or sorry gas has a much lower carbon intensity than coal. Um, we'll potentially see some nuclear extension in, in the U.S., al although I'm, I'm slightly skeptical um, or it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out um, as, as um, we're not seeing a, a lot of new um, uh, nuclear extension in the U.S. And, and then finally, we'll see other backup and power to gas applications to get to the full uh, two degrees Celsius path. So with this growth of renewables, what, what does it mean for the generation mix um, in, in the US? Um, and what we see, so what, what, you, what you see here is essentially um, in 2015 and 2030 and 2050, you've got um, the capacity on, uh, of each uh, generation technology. Uh, the baseline projection on the left-hand side essentially assumes um, no, no commitment, small growth to renewables. And then on the right-hand side, the full two degrees Celsius path shows you the increase in capacities as a result of, uh, of the re of renewable growth to meet uh, the Paris Climate Commitment. And um, as, as I already alluded to, um, you're gonna see massive increases in um, both solar, uh, uh, mainly solar and wind uh, capacity. Uh, those are the two green bars. Um, and then uh, a small amount of, of, of other renewables. I think what's, um, what's interesting in this chart, and you, got, you can compare to the next chart I'm about to show, but you see under the two degrees Celsius path, you see massive increases in, in, in the capacity. You see capacity doubling, um, sorry, tripling between 2015 to all the way out to 2050. And this is being driven by the intermittency and um, and you because you're about to see in the next page load is actually not uh, likely not growing too too much in the U.S. Uh, somewhat due to electrification, but this massive capacity increase um, is a result of the intermittency of renewables. And you also see under the two degrees Celsius path um, that gray bar the importance of gas and the the need for gas to balance renewables um, even in the uh, in even in the two degrees Celsius path. If we go to the next page, as I alluded to, uh, the, the next page um, has the same, same statistics, but now we're, instead of looking at capacities or, or megawatts, we're looking at what's at terawatt hours. So we're looking at the number of uh, uh, kilowatt hours of electricity produced. Again, to meet the two degrees Celsius path, you need massive uh, growth of solar and wind, um, but you can see here the, um, we're, we're not seen as, as huge of a growth in capacities as you saw on the previous page um, be, be, because um, of energy efficiency um, and, um, and you, know, you don't need the, the huge capacity to, to, to balance the renewables. Mark, um, I, I alluded to this, but um, wanted to share a little bit um, of US-based numbers. And I, you know, I think these numbers would be pretty similar uh, in Indonesia as well, but um, we've one of the drivers without um, the need for a policy for the growth of renewables in the United States is, is declining costs. And um, what you see here on the left hand side, you see the the um, and we're I'm going to use a term called LCOE or levelized cost of electricity. But uh, you can essentially think of this as the all in cost of of the uh, the power source. And uh, the left-hand side, CCGT. So these are these are gas plants, and you can see um, excluding incentives. So there are, there are no incentives included here. You can see today the um, uh, the LCOE or the cost of wind and solar, um, and you can see unsubsidized. Uh, they're very competitive, and you know often can beat um, the costs associated with gas. Um, we see going forward um, in 2023 and, and, and continuing um, expected uh, reductions in both wind and solar cost. Um, and, you know, again, this is a technology that um, in the United States, at least, we see able to compete um, in most parts of the country with, uh, with gas, with coal, with nuclear um, um, unsubsidized. And, and of course, 
you know, um, as we think about uh, implications on Indonesia, you know, policy also does play a role here. And we do have um, a, a couple um, important uh, federal tax credits that, um, that help drive these technologies. Uh, beyond a federal tax credit, um, there's a set of important policies in the US and Marco, if you can jump to the next page, um, that are pretty that are important drivers to renewables in the US. And they're, they're, they're called Renewable Portfolio Standards or, or RPS for short. Um, what, what these policies are is essentially a mandate for um, at a state level for the utilities in that state to procure uh, a certain percentage or amount of renewables by a certain date. Um, the, as you can see on the map, um, they're, they're very, they vary by state by state and can be drastically different. Um, but especially in states like my state of California, uh, states in the Northeast, um, we have very aggressive policies and mandates driving renewable energy. That said, as I alluded to, um, there are, because of um, the cost of renewables and how well it competes with other uh, generation sources, we see, especially in states that don't have aggressive policies, um, renewables um, penetration far exceed uh, the policy regulation. Uh, Texas is a great example. Um, so is Arizona. So are many of the states in the uh, in the south, uh, southwest where because, based on purely economic um, uh, drivers, we see renewables um, excel in those areas and, and far exceed the policy target that was, that was created. And it, from, from my personal view is, is the right way things are done, right? Or what is the ways that we can help incentivize uh, renewables, but do so in a market-based way um, that, that isn't, isn't um, you know, mandated by a specific target? So with that, I wanted to spend um, in, in my last couple minutes. I, you know, I, in addition to working in the power renewable space, I, I, I have spent a lot of my BCG career also working uh, with oil and gas players, both local players in California, but also uh, several larger players across the U.S. and globally, to help think through the business model associated with renewable energy and um, help players understand what are the ways that. Um, the oil and gas industry, given its incredibly strong EPC and project management capabilities, construction capabilities, access to capital, what are the ways that um, it, the oil and gas industry can leverage, leverage its strengths in, in terms of uh, developing and, and uh, building a business model in, in renewables? Uh, Marco, maybe I'll, I'll jump ahead just to get in the interest of time here. Um, if you can go one more, one more slide. Yeah, I think it's helpful, um, helpful to articulate and just set a little bit of context around the four main business models we see in the U.S. Uh, around renewables. Um, and again, there's, these these business models are not that fundamentally different uh, from many of the business models in your own business. But I do think it's helpful to talk through these as we think through implications of of, of renewable business models. Um, the, the first, uh, so there's maybe it's helpful for me to start. The, the there are, there are four key components of um, the the renewable value chain. Starting on the left hand side, dev or development, um, which is where you, well you develop the asset, construct and build the uh, the renewables plant. Uh, the second step there is own, um, which is um, exactly as uh, as you would think. It's the finance. You have a financial stake. In the uh, in the asset um, number three um, O and M here you manage and um, uh, and and operate and maintain the asset going forward and then finally number the last step market which is um, not that similar to a, a kind of trading function um, you make sure you identify and help uh, uh, help uh, identify an off taker um, or someone to buy the green electricity from you. Um, we see core, four key models in, in the U.S. One of them is um, this integrated end-to-end uh, -end solution where you, you provide every step of the, um, you, you uh, play across the full value chain. Um, a, another important business model we see and one that has higher returns because it's slightly more risky is number two, develop and flip, where you focus uh, on uh, developing and building the asset, but then 
um, flip it and or uh, sell it once it's operating to to another party. Um, often, who your number three is the catcher, so to speak, from the from the flip, an owner operator or someone who um, owns and then operates the asset but doesn't develop it. And then finally, number four, you do see players who focus just on operating um, and uh, leverage their asset management. Um, field force capabilities to just uh, to just operate and provide maintenance on uh, on on uh, on renewables. Mark, if you go to the yeah, so I, you know, one of the things I, I won't go through this slide in detail, uh, although obviously happy to take questions on this. But you know, as I alluded to, um, the different the business models have different trade offs, uh, and they and and again, these are U.S. numbers. Um, and happy to talk through what would be the implications for Indonesia. But um, depending on the risk return profile of the different models, we see uh, different uh, uh, profitability um, and IRRs associated with it. And then obviously different um, capabilities are required to be successful. But I, I think if we just focus on the top row there, um, as you can, the integrated end to end model number one, we typically see unlevered IRRs in the US in the eight to 10%. Um, again, you're, you're kind of, it's kind of the mix uh, of returns across the whole value chain. Um, as I alluded to, the develop and flip um, is the most riskiest of the different business models. And thus, um, we see a, a slightly higher uh, IRR typically associated with that model. Um, on the other end, the owner operator is um, the, the safest, uh, the least risky part of, of the value chain. Um, the, the asset is already operating. In most cases in the US, there is a, a what's called a power purchase agreement. So a guaranteed off taker of the electricity. And so returns associated with that part of the, that business model are, are relatively low, four to six percent. And we see pension funds and, um, and other uh, ca uh, capital seeking low returns there. And then finally, on the operator side, um, we we switch the metric here from IRR to gross margin. Uh, but you know, if done well, you can see relatively high gross margins in the in the fifteen to twenty percent. Um, Mark, if you can jump to the, yeah, I think I covered interest of time. I'll skip skip this page. Um, I think this this page is helpful. Um, uh, you know, the, when, when we see the returns associated with renewables um, can look quite different um, and, and uh, to oil and gas expected returns and cash flow. And uh, apologies for the, the slides coming up here, a little funky here. But I think the top um, is, is helpful in the sense that um, renewables, the, the ca cash flow associated with renewables is typically, a, it's, a, you know, one time up front. Um, costs associated with the capital of the equipment and the costs associated with the with the development and construction, um, you know that may take that capital and, and construction expense may be allocated over a year or two. A, a typical utility, um, solar or wind farm can can take a year or two to to to, to develop. Uh, but from there, you then have a, a an, an incredibly and generally stable cash flow um, um, associated with um, the electricity that's being produced by that uh, that renewable asset, especially in the U.S., where the majority of the offtake um, are utilities or corporate players that sign long twenty-year contracts, uh, you have a, a, a very steady uh, uh, cash flow. Um, I, I have a couple global examples. Then on the right-hand side of an, uh, you know typical investment profiles and cash flows associated with um, uh, with oil, with uh, oil and gas assets. Uh, and they, you know, they are obviously very different um, and and much more lumpy in terms of their, uh, in in terms of the the cash flow and the investment that's needed. And then, yeah, and then one, you know, one last slide just to give you a little bit of um, we introduced the business models in the in the in the previous slide, but I did want to. Give a little bit of perspective of um, some of the major players uh, associated in utility scale renewables value chain and uh, some of the US players. Of course, on the manufacturing side, you have a set of component OEMs um, who, who uh, uh, manufacture solar modules 
um, or wind turbines, um, and then the, the, the remaining uh, racking and other systems associated with the construction of renewables. Um, in the middle there, you have project developers, uh, players who focus on that, either that end-to-end -end or the developer flip model that I articulated before. Uh, players like uh, NextEra Energy, uh, who are, is a large utility and renewables and energy developer. Um, I, the, the team most notably that uh, just exceeded, um, the market cap exceeded uh, the, just a couple years ago, a couple months ago, um, the, the market cap of ExxonMobil and uh, you know the largest exceeded all the uh, oil and gas super majors. So you know, at Next Era, proven that with a renewable and power business model, um, they can generate um, significant cash flow. Uh, you have project financing, as you can imagine, that is an important business model um, and an important component. Um, billions of dollars are spent up front um, as these are capital and intensive uh, industries. And so you have banks like JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, but also um, in the, uh, renewable specific curve players like Solar Mosaic, who focus on the financing piece. Um, as you can imagine, EPC, and um, we see important set of uh, players focused just on the, the construction piece of utility scale renewables. Um, and then you have a variety of OMM service and, and off takers. Um, and I think, you know, you see the name Google there. Um, in the US, we see corporate, uh, uh, corporate large corporate tech, technology and other players emerge as a major off taker for renewable energy as they strive to meet their own uh, decarbonization targets. So with that, I will, um, I, I'm, I'm going to hand it off to Marco. I'm happy to uh, take questions. I think we're going to let Marco go and then uh, would love um, for you all to be thinking about questions. I know I went through that quick, um, but we wanted to be explicit, um, you know, on some of the perspectives and what we saw in the U.S., but um, as I think was nicely noted at the beginning, this is not a copy and paste. And so Marco is going to help take uh, a bit of what um, we've learned in the U.S. To, and, and apply it to Indonesia. Thanks a lot, Tom. Uh, so let me take you a little bit through the learnings which we had not only in Indonesia, but also across Asia Pacific. Um, we actually think that the learnings uh, in the other Southeast Asian countries can actually serve as, uh, as the input and maybe accelerator just to avoid some of the pitfalls that we have seen in the other markets. And um, just to paraphrase uh, pa Andre and uh, Patono from the very beginning, it's, uh, it's definitely not something where we can replicate the ex experience. It's something where we need to uh, basically adjust the experience to the local context and to the Indonesian context. Tom and myself had actually a lot of discussions lately about Asia Pacific uh, because of two reasons. Asia Pacific is, is definitely the region to be in when it comes to the renewables because of its size, but also Asia Pacific offers very, very different possibilities from a very mature markets, like for example, Australian market, which is, which is a fully traded market, which is a fully merchandised and open market to some nascent markets, which, which actually invest quite a bit in the, in the renewables, like for example, Vietnam. So uh, the interest of the, of the investors is huge and the investors actually come from very different angles. Uh, you have the investors which are looking at the renewables as part of their core business, like the utilities, uh, which are natural owners actually of the, of the, of the renewables. Uh, you have investors which are looking at that as a part of the transition, like for, for example, oil and, gas, oil and gas companies, and a lot of discussions, or actually majority of discussions have been with the oil and gas companies and how to expand the portfolio and go into the renewables. But you actually have quite a bit of discussions with the pure financial investors, like the sovereign funds, like the PE funds, which are looking at the renewables like a hot topic, like emerging topic, actually to pour money in because of the yield uh, or because of a steady revenue flow, which they can get uh, in the future. This actually made the whole topic of renewables actually probably the first one in the, in the, in the priority of all the topics that we discuss, but also something which needs to be carefully tackled because as we've seen recently, uh, the valuations of the renewable companies in Asia Pacific are actually skyrocketing, which makes maybe some of the acquisitions quite questionable. Um, 
as you can imagine, Asia Pacific needs to or deserves a granular approach. So each and every of the territories are very different. I will not go through each and every of these. I will focus much more on Indonesia. But what's important to see is that you actually have uh, three components which are the same across the across the territories. So basically, the first one is very very ambitious targets, which range from 20% all the way to 50 or 60 percent by by 2030 or 2040 in terms of the installed capacity in the renewables. Then the second one, um, there is um, a regulation which is very very different across the countries. So basically, for example, for, 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 from the regulation uh, in in the Philippines, uh, where you have a fully traded market, similar like uh, Australia, to the regulation in 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 for example Vietnam, where you have the, still the feed-in tariff. Uh, which is one of the highest, not only in the region, but in the world, which can go up to 90 uh, US dollars per megawatt hour. Or, for example, the situation which is somewhere in the middle with the auctions, like, for example, in, 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 uh, in Malaysia. In all this spectrum, uh, Indonesia is somewhere at the beginning. So basically, Indonesia is still considered as a nascent market, where we still have uh, a form of a feed-in tariff, and I will talk a little bit later, uh, what are the upsides and downsides of this kind of approach. Um, if you want to check what is the investability or the attractiveness of each and every market in Southeast Asia, um, we actually constructed the matrix. Um, how to read the matrix? So the x-axis, the horizontal axis are different technologies, while the y-axis are different territories or different geographies. And uh, basically the intensity of the color illustrates what is the attractiveness for the investor. Um, how do we uh, define the attractiveness? So Tom in his presentation mentioned LCOE, levelized cost of electricity. So the lower this levelized cost of electricity is, the more competitive this technology will be. But LCOE is also something what is actually a compound measure and which depends on many, many factors. And some of these factors that we take into account when constructing this kind of matrix is actually what are the feed-in tariffs or the auctions, who are the competitors, how easy or difficult is it to get the permitting, uh, is the land expensive, what is the stability of the regulatory regimes, which is one of the challenges in, 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 in Southeast Asia. And we get a matrix like this. This matrix doesn't reflect the capability of the uh, investor itself, uh, because obviously when we decide which, which market we want to address, we need to find a route how to invest in the market. So basically this matrix is just a starting position. What is interesting here is that Indonesia has a potential across the technologies, but this potential, I would say, is a little bit shy. So you can see that the color here is not, is not very intense. And um, this is a reflection of the way how uh, basically the, 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 the tenders are being conducted in Indonesia and uh, which of the technologies are, are actually being on the, on the top of the list. Um, and of course, in Indonesia, like in every other country, what, what's useful to check is uh, uh, basically what is the government projection of the roles of different technologies. So here we use the uh, uh, energy volume uh, projection, uh, which is coming from the ROPTL from 2019. Some of these numbers have been changed uh, during the COVID, but uh, this, is, this is still the some baseline which we are taking into account. And you can see here that uh, uh, the growth of the, of the penetration of the renewables in terms of the volume is, is, is very high, so it's 15% CAGR. Uh, uh, but what's also interesting is that you have actually two technologies which are dominating, and these two technologies are actually uh, uh, hydropower and geothermal. And back to Pahadi's comment at the very beginning, uh, we need to take into account the specificities of, uh, of Indonesia, particularly the geothermal, because as we can see, it's playing a major role in, in, in the whole story about the renewables, and I'm happy to speak later a little bit more about it. Uh, plans are one, but actually the reality is completely another situation. So if we take into account what is the energy production cost or the LCOE, uh, and when we plot it on the, on the, on the kind of time curve, uh, 
uh, we can get the graph like this. It's a complicated graph, but let me try to guide you through the through the through through, through what it shows. Uh, so basically, each of the lines here depict the different technologies. So the yellow line is the solar PV. Uh, the, the the green line is the wind. Uh, you also have the geothermal, which is this dark red line. And you can see that throughout the time, these lines are going down, which actually means that the the, the, the technology is becoming cheaper and the energy production cost is actually becoming lower and lower, which actually means that uh, the, the renewable technology can compete uh, with, uh, with the conventional technologies. This big yellow stripe in the middle is actually the baseline in Indonesia, and this is the coal uh, and the gas. Um, and you can see that it's quite wide. And it's quite wide because you have power plants of different age, you have power plants uh, of different grade of coal and different cost of coal. Uh, but what's interesting is that uh, it can go down as as low as 60 US dollars per megawatt hour or even lower. And the, basically, this is the reality that we need to uh, to con to confront. And this is the reality where um, if the renewable is not uh, is not cost competitive with the, with the conventional, then we need to count on the on the support from the government. Um, and recently, I have copy pasted here one of the very recent, actually last week's uh, sources uh, from the Carbon Pulse is that um, Indonesia is actually starting to follow the trends in the in the in the states and in Europe, and this is to introduce the carbon tax. And carbon tax is something what will uh, actually change the, the, this yellow horizontal stripe on the previous slide, and it, it will actually shift it up uh, because when you put the the carbon tax on top of the of the of the coal and gas uh, cost of production you will get something which is more expensive and where in the whole uh, basically competition between the renewable cost and uh, and the conventional cost you will have renewables as something which will come out cheaper um, i would say that the carbon tax is something what is uh, very welcome from the renewable perspective but on the other hand needs to be taken with uh, with a grain of salt and it's, it's, it's rather an evolution step rather than a revolution step, because as you can imagine, a lot of power plants which are in the PLNs fleet and which are in the, in the baseload fleet might be heavily impacted uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the carbon cost. When it comes to the overall, uh, overall ambition and the overall capacity that uh, can be achieved, uh, we are definitely talking about huge numbers. So on the left-hand side, you see the, the potential power generation across the technologies. I just need to say that in geothermal 29 has been a number which has been undisputed for a long time. Uh, using the new uh, kind of measurement, uh, uh, we have a new number, which is 23 gigawatts, but still 23 gigawatts uh, positions Indonesia as the second largest uh, source of geothermal energy after the States. What is interesting on this slide is basically the right hand side and uh, uh, what works and what doesn't work or what needs to be improved. So basically what definitely works well is that uh, in, in March last year, uh, we have finally had this shift from the uh, traditional boot scheme uh, into something which is which is the PPA based uh, uh, type of contracting. Um, why is that important? Because according to the boot scheme, uh, basically the owners of the renewable technology needed to hand over the assets and uh, and uh, and the land to PLN up to the uh, up to the expiry of the of the contract. Now PLN is actually uh, free to do the commercial contract, which is called PPA Power Purchase Agreement, with the producers, which actually make the whole story of contracting much much easier and much more. Uh, attractive for the investors as well. Uh, what is the downside of this scheme is that PLN uh, is capped in the PPA. So basically PLN can't contract any kind of price. It's capped by its internal cost of production. And this internal cost of production is quite low, uh, as you can imagine for the coal uh, without the carbon tax. Uh, uh, Java is taken as, uh, as a baseline. So basically if we want to invest in the renewables, we need to be cheaper than the than the uh, than the PLN's internal cost. Um, I will talk a little bit more about Master Clean Energy Project and Chirata as 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 one of uh, of, of a lighthouses of the recent development. Um, and let me switch for, for the sake of time to the next slide. So basically, um, there are two good examples. One of the investments in Indonesia. Uh, one is the Mazdar. 
uh, which is the example from the from the last year of the 145 megawatt of the of the of the floating solar. And the other one is the Venus uh, uh, investment in in two projects, uh, uh, basically in Lobok and in in the, in the North Sulawesi, which amount to 40 megawatts. Both numbers might seem quite low, uh, but the, these two projects are basically the largest ones when it comes to the to the to the solar. They're definitely not enough to reach the targets which the government has, but are uh, a good and positive step forward. So let me deep dive a little bit in the Mazdar example. Uh, so basically, this is the Chirata Reservoir, and I took this because Chirata Reservoir had a contracted price as low as 30, uh, 30 USD, US dollars per megawatt hour, which is extremely low for the solar, but actually shows that uh, basically solar can go as low as the lowest uh, coal and even lower than that. Uh, and basically, this actually shows that there is a potential uh, for this kind of contracting. Uh, the key precondition here has been cheap cost of capital because the VAC uh, that Master could offer for this project has been extremely low. So it's very, very low single digits, uh, as low as 2%. And as you can see, I mean, the in investments in the renewables is a fine balancing act in which you need to have all the, all the, all the variables uh, lined up well. And basically the cost of capital extremely low, also the cost of equipment. Um, of course, uh, the cost of equipment for many investors we have spoken to is one of the main uh, uh, preconditions when deciding if to enter this kind of projects because of the, of the local content and the local content uh, requirement sometimes actually increases the cost. Uh, compared to the cost in the in the other countries in Southeast Asia, and this is something what needs to be taken quite seriously. Um, and one uh, macro observation: um, so when we speak to the investors, one of the questions is how actually COVID uh, impacted the whole situation with the renewables. Um, I need to say that uh, COVID actually stopped a lot of investments or delayed the investments. Uh, for example, we have not seen the investments in geothermal in the last year. Uh, so this is something what, uh, what, what, what hasn't been a favorable development, uh, but also which has a deep reflection uh, on the PLN. PLN in the whole story of the renewables is one of the crucial stakeholders because PLN itself is the party which uh, needs to tender the renewable development when it comes to the solar. And you can imagine that in the situation of um, extremely low tariff in Indonesia, which is which is among the lowest ones in Southeast Asia, PLN has already before COVID had a huge pressure on uh, its internal cost of production and the margins were extremely low. Uh, and in some of the regions negative as well. Uh, with COVID, basically the whole story became even worse because uh, the demand dropped. And on the other hand, uh, uh, you had a situation of a huge pipeline or a large pipeline of contracted uh, coal power plants. So basically you had a pressure on the internal PLN's fleet from both sides, both from the demand side, but also the PLN's, uh, the, the, the supply side, because you had a lot of new capacity which was going, uh, which was going online. And then you can imagine that PLN by itself won't be incentivized to do the tenders for the renewables, which will even uh, more lower the, 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 the utilization of its, uh, of its own fleet. And this is one of the factors where uh, we would definitely need the help from the government uh, uh, basically to uh, stimulate or motivate PLN more in these new tendering cycles and in the contracting if we want to see the larger, uh, uh, the larger uh, 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 increase in the penetration of the renewables. Um, it is without any doubt that the PLN has the ambition and that the PLN has the, the, the will to do that. But obviously we need to find a good, uh, a good financial model for this without actually impacting uh, PLN's cost of generation by this penetration. This is a very important point because um, at the end of the day, uh, we need to find the right balance uh, between the investment in the renewables and between the current, uh, the current installation. Because here again, we are not talking about the revolution, we are talking about the evolution towards the target. And this evolution needs to be done in the small steps. And these steps actually need to be defined. And a couple of uh, concluding thoughts at the very end. Um, we have mentioned some of them uh, in Tom's part, 
uh, I would underline uh, one one of the hot factors which is which is which is important for for Indonesia. This is distributed generation. Um, so a lot of players in Indonesia are starting to talk about distributed uh, energy. Uh, we started talking for, uh, for, from, from the rooftop solar, uh, because as you might be aware, the government has has uh, intention to put the rooftop solar on top of the government buildings. They're talking about two to three or even four gigawatts of distributed generation. But uh, an adjacent topic to that has been captive uh, generation. So basically the generation in which you are satisfying your own demand, like uh, for being industrial customers, you're basically installing the renewables in order to de decarbonize uh, the supply for for the industrial uh, for the industrial customers. And uh, uh, concretely, uh, Pertamina with extremely ambitious targets, transition targets, is one of, uh, of uh, I would say, lighthouses in Indonesia when speaking about this kind of uh, this kind of uh, activities. On the other hand, it also reflects the reality because the captive power doesn't require a PLN standard. And the captive power is something what relies basically only on your own pushes, uh, which actually shows that uh, uh, investors are trying to find the ways in which uh, in which uh, the hurdle for the investment in uh, in the in the in the renewable is not determined by the tender itself. Um, and one last concluding remark: um, Indonesia has a huge potential, but as said at the beginning, is basically the tail end of the of the development of the renewables in Southeast Asia. Um, this is partly the historical uh, 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 reflection because of the uh, coal production and a huge coal, uh, coal fleet, but on the other hand, also the reflection of, um, let's say, uh, the need to strengthen the policies and the need to strike the right balance without actually impacting other stakeholders too much. Uh, what is interesting is that the um, interest of the investors is huge the interest for the energy transition is actually huge. And I would say that in the last two years, we have seen also the uh, kind of awareness, which increased tremendously compared to the previous period about the need for the renewables and about the need for the investments here. Uh, and um, as a part of that, for example, only in the last month, we had uh, a couple of discussions on the geothermal, which has been the topic which hasn't been mentioned for a long time. But now it's again uh, getting a lot of traction and a lot of interest from the investors, not only from Indonesia, but also uh, uh, foreign investors in Indonesia. Uh, let me stop here uh, for the sake of time. Uh, uh, hope that this has been uh, uh, a good introduction and a trigger for the discussion. And that Tom and myself would be very pleased to continue this in a more interactive environment uh, and to get your questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Tom and Mr. Marco. I think it's a helpful explanation yeah, for us in Indonesia. Now we are moving on to question and answer session. Uh, for the audience who want to ask a question, we have uh, two we, we have two ways to express your question. The first way is to express the question through the chat box, or the second way is to express your question by direct question for, uh, to the panelists. And the, the, the question will be answered directly by Mr. Tom and Mr. Marco for each question. And for the, the, for the questioner, will be given one follow-up question for each question. Okay, now I will read first the uh, question to the chat box. The first question from Putu Eka. Question to Tom, Mr. Tom. What is your view, assuming that U.S. will successfully implement implement the two degree path? What is your view on the amount of fossil fuel availability in U.S. by that time, or how the fossil fuel will, will evolve with this change along the line? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, thank you for the question. So, I, you know, I think there's I think there's two ways I can answer the question, and I don't know if it was from a demand or from a supplies perspective. You know, from a demand perspective, um, the majority of the analysis looking at uh, the U.S. and the two degrees Celsius path, you know, still has about 20 percent of fossil fuels in our, if not a little bit more, in our energy mix. And, um, you know, where we're going to continue to see fossil fuel are going to be in the hard, hard to decarbonize parts of, 
um, um, of our energy mix, including heavy transportation, um, uh, air travel, um, the last part of the power decarbonization, um, and a couple other industrial industrial uses. Um, so I, you know, I, and and as I alluded to before, you know, there's going to be an important need for gas um, to help balance intermittent renewables. And there's some great questions we'll get to on green hydrogen and CCS, which I, I do think are two technologies that are emerging to help um, with that deep decarbonization. Uh, but there are going to be, you know, there are some fundamental aspects of the economy that are, are just fundamentally uh, difficult to, to fully decarbonize. You know, from, a, from a supply perspective, um, I, I, you know, I think um, I, I probably don't have the strongest view on um, what it looks like, but um, the, the U.S. players will continue to focus on, um, I think, cost. And, you know, what's increasingly going to be important, I think, is the carbon intensity of the, of the production. So the oil and gas clients that I advise in the U.S., you know, are, we have conversations around um, your portfolio and the mix of heavy versus light oil. And, um, you know, thinking through making acquisitions or divestitures that um, focus more of the of our uh, clients' portfolio on, on lighter and better, higher carbon in, or lower carbon intensity. Um, you know, the other thing that I think is going to be important for the U.S. supply is uh, decarbonization of scope one emissions and looking for ways to, um, through renewable energy, through um, electrification, um, uh, to identify ways to reduce um, the emissions associated with production of, of oil and gas. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tom. Is there any feedback or follow-up questions? Mr. Kuduega? Okay, I think there is no feedback, yeah. Okay, we continue to question number two from Mr. Arjuna Srivijaya. Question to Mr. Tom, how do you think about integration of fossil fuel energy supply and renewable energy supply? Example, in a gas pipeline, pipe city A to city B, with distance 300 kilometers, installed open access valve every 80 kilometers, in which on the access valve point is installed solar cell electric power plant, wind electric power plant, geothermal power plant. Besides, on the, on the access point, valve area is installed a manufacturing plant for battery of electric vehicle plant. The ultimate goal is to get optimum utilization of gas as non-renewable energy together in its util utilization altogether with renewable energy instead of consuming all or most of gas res resources into energy for fuel in households or for transportation or for burning in gas turbine. Yeah, maybe Mr. Tomber. Yeah, I like this question. Um, I agree. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of advantages of, of you know, co-siting and combining these resources together. And we're seeing this in the US. I'll, I'll give you three examples. Um, you know, the example you use, I think is spot on and we're seeing um, developers like um, GE and, and that make gas turbines and other players are, um, are looking for ways to co-site. And we see, we have many facilities in the US where you see solar and or wind paired with uh, gas CCGTs. Um, and there's a lot of advantages because you provide, um, you know, one of the challenges with any generation source on the grid is interconnecting it to the grid. And so your ability to, to uh, pair the gas on site with the renewables is something that we're absolutely seeing. Um, but I, I, I think there's a couple other examples where this is, this is occurring as well. Um, one of them um, is in um, the heating space. Um, so I, I've done a lot of work with uh, gas um, uh, LDCs, local distribution companies, gas utilities in the US. And um, we're seeing really interesting opportunities, especially in colder parts of the United States where um, you, we have hy hybrid heat pumps. So heat pumps that are both electric, but also gas. And um, this, this combination is, uh, is really nice for the best of both worlds. You, you see in incredibly low temperatures, um, gas be the most efficient um, source of, of heating. And then at, at slightly, and by cold temperatures, I mean, you know, a negative 10 degrees Celsius, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty cold. Um, and then, but at, at a little bit more moderate temperatures, 
uh, zero to 15 degrees Celsius uh, electric is the most efficient form. And so um, looking, you know, often people make an individual's decision, they either pick electric or um, uh, gas heating, but the ability to combine two, so you're getting the most efficient um, heating is one that we see, especially in the uh, northern parts of the United States. And then finally, the last example on this, um, in this one I'll highlight and is from um, my home state of California. As this group may have seen, we are uh, impacted by wildfires and we have many uh, uh, issues where um, we have what are called public safety power shutoffs, uh, which is essentially when uh, there's a risk of wildfire, wind is blowing high, we, um, we preemptively shut down the power to avoid the creation of a wildfire. Well, uh, the California utilities are looking for ways to combine electric infrastructure with gas infrastructure that already exists throughout the state through, um, so that when during those power shutoff uh, um, uh, events, a community has um, uh, uh, you know, an access to a gas fuel cell um, or another way to generate electricity to, to make, up, make up for the fact to, to that uh, uh, the power shut off. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tong. For Mr. Arjuna Srivijaya, is there any feedback or follow-up question? Yeah, I think there is no... Uh, thank you. Feedback. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Good yeah. evening. I think your advice uh, will be applicable, applicable to our Indonesia big island, yeah, such as Sumatra and Java. But I'm thinking how to apply this idea on... <laughs> On small island, like you know, there will be a, a, a huge a, 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 a project in Indonesia in Marcella, yeah, where the, where the updated uh, plan from government is to put the gas processing plant on shore yeah, in in the Tanimbar Island. Yeah. But uh, it's a small island. How to distribute that uh, gas uh, consumption optimization to a small island around that province? Yeah, that's only a province of Maluku, yeah. I don't think I cannot imagine how to distribute that gas utilization to small island which can locate about 100 kilometer, 20 kilometer around that uh, gas processing plant on shore. Yeah? Because the situation in Indonesia and the USA is very, very different. Yeah? We are archipelago. Yeah? How do you have any other uh, suggestion for this situation? Yeah, well, we have... Um... So um, there's one part of the U.S. that's not that different from the Indonesia, and that's Hawaii. So I've uh, I've been, been lucky enough to spend um, a couple years working with Hawaiian Electric and the governor of Hawaii on on some of these uh, similar issues. And um, I, I I don't think I have a silver bullet or um, a perfect answer, but I think um, a couple of the solutions that we explored in Hawaii, um, one of them was. Um, you have one, a central gas plant, but you, you know, we, there aren't, for the most part, there isn't a, a distribution pipelines for gas in, in Hawaii, uh, but instead we explore trucking opportunities. So um, using, you know, small trucks to, to, to deliver trucks in other parts of the island. Um, I, I, I think the other solution um, that, that's important is going to be electrification. Um, it's much easier to transport um, um, electrons than it is molecules of gas. And so um, if you're able to build out the electric infrastructure, um, um, you're, you know, and, and electrify some of the other gas uses in the island and instead burn the gas in a central uh, localized place to create, uh, to create electricity, um, I think you can find that to be an efficient solution um, and, and use the electron as an energy carrier across the island. Maybe if I can add here to, to Tom's comment. So Bar Yuna, this, this is an excellent question. <laughs> and indeed, this is what makes Indonesia unique. Uh, and uh, as part of, of, of one of our projects with, uh, with, with PLN, we, we, we actually took a look into the Papua Maluku region <laughs> as, as one which actually has two problems. The first problem is electrification. And the second problem is uh, basically the carbon footprint. Because as, as you know, diesel generators are dominating the energy production, energy generation over there. And um, one of the solutions for, 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 for these problems is actually not to squeeze out or, or to replace completely uh, diesel generation, 
but basically to supplement it with the renewables. Uh, so basically to go into the off-grid uh, captive type of installations that would supply energy uh, throughout the day, uh, uh, possibly together with the battery, and then basically to use the diesel generation during the night, because this is this step. Um, because decarbonization will definitely not be the revolution. So, so, so you will not be able to squeeze out everything immediately. Gas is a potential mid-step. The other potential mid-step is actually to go with, uh, with, with this kind of captive renewables, or maybe even the combination uh, together with gas. Uh, but definitely, definitely a lot of creativity will be needed how to do this. Maybe uh, maybe I have another question, two questions maybe. So hope is the last. How, uh, first to Tom Baker, uh, how is the latest technology to uh, utilize uh, high content of gas like in our Indonesia Natuna Alpha uh, gas source? Because so for many, many, many after have been 50 years, five zero years, Indonesia have, has not yet cannot uh, <laughs> utilize that resource in Natuna Alpha. Yeah? I hear that British Petroleum have the latest technology, but it's very, very big uh, technology, very, very high price technology. How do you think about the utilize that, that uh, resource gas with high CO2 content, uh, which could uh, up to 65% CO2? Maybe you have other updated technology for this that is uh, possible to apply in Indonesia, in Natuna? Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, a couple of thoughts. One is, um, you know, there is an opportunity to directly convert gas to electricity through, um, through a fuel cell. Um, and we are seeing application, you know, continued evolution of um, fuel cell catalysts that are used um, to help uh, provide uh, backup electricity, um, et cetera, similar to what Marco described. And I think that's a place where we'll see uh, technology evolution. Um, I think we're also seeing the growth of CCS and, um, you know, here, here is, I think, an important technology where, uh, for example, whether it's industrial processes or it's the burning of gas in a, in, in, in a CCGT that um, can play a role, especially, you know, one of the, one of the challenges with, um, with CCS is you'd like a high capacity factor, which is, which is to say you want them you want the, um, the gas to be burning for a steady time. But I think applications like islands where um, you're not just using the gas to, for peaking like you do in the mainland of US, but where you're actually gonna be burning for long periods of the day and material amounts of gas, um, that enables a high capacity factor to allow you to amateurize the high costs of, of, of CCS. Um, and, and I don't know, Marco, maybe you have a better perspective on, you know, in, in the U.S., we have aquifers and, uh, and, and other depleted wells that can serve as good sequestration uh, for, for CO2. I would, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about the Indonesia-specific um, geology. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, we didn't take a, a deep look into this part, but uh, definitely in Indonesia, what comes to mind are, are actually two types of wells. One are oil and gas wells, and the other one are geothermal wells. Uh, basically for the sequestration and uh, 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 the, the, the only question is uh, basically how far or what kind of pipeline do you need to, to, to construct or what kind of transportation uh, for the CO2 you need to do in order to, uh, in order to transport it to the well where you actually do the injection uh, and then basically the technology for the injection itself. Uh, we have taken a look uh, for this in some other markets and uh, the only thing what, 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 what I can say here is basically that the cost uh, is still something what needs to drop, what needs to go down, uh, but we have high hopes for this kind of technology in the future. Um, currently, CCUS is one of the ways how to do the carbon offsets. The other way where I think Indonesia has even more chances currently at this point of time is our nature-based solutions. Um, in which you basically uh, uh, plant the forest, in which you basically stimulate the farmers uh, in order to plant the, 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 in order to use the land to plant the forest, 
in order to generate the natural sink uh, mm -hmm. for the CO2. Um, uh, and we have been involved as BCG in the, actually uh, standing up of some of the, of the uh, carbon exchanges here in the region. Uh, because as you might know, one of the big problems with the carbon exchange is actually the credibility or the trust. Uh, of, because there is a lot of different qualities of the carbon credits which are yeah, floating yeah. around in the market. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Um, if you have this kind of a credible technology like CCUS or a credible source of the nature-based solutions, uh, then basically this makes sense. What definitely doesn't make sense is uh, to trade the carbon credits which uh, where you have a part of the forest or the jungle uh, which is which is actually planted for the five years and then after that it's being cut and basically this is even worse than if you if you if you didn't have it at all um, so this is something this is something what is definitely going to be the future because the whole decarbonization of the value chain is not going to be possible uh, to the complete zero especially mm. if it takes scope two and scope three emissions uh, so that's why you need to have carbon sinks or carbon, or, 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 or carbon offsets. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And maybe this is my last question to Tom or maybe to Marco. How about the latest uh, research or technology in USA to convert uh, gas into food? <laughs> because we don't know our future. Yeah? Maybe in the, in the future we have a lack of resource of food, of the rice or any other food resources. Maybe you have to think to, to convert gas into food from, to take the carbon, the atom of carbon and hydrogen into food. <laughs> How do you think about this, my strange, about my, this, my, this strange question? <laughs> um. That's a great question. I, I don't know if I'm going to have um, something willing to say. I think, you know, we do have some startups in, in Silicon Valley and close close to me that are focused on um, artificial meats and, um, you know, uh, other artificial sources of protein that um, I don't know if they use gas per se as a uh, as a primary resource. But, you know, at the end of the day, they are taking uh, they are taking carbon. Um, I, you know, I think the best answer, my personal view and the best answer is you can't beat nature. Um, photosynthesis is a, is a beautiful process. So instead, we should be um, looking for ways, alternatives to um, uh, biofuels, and corn and sugar cane and other um, food stocks that are used for energy. And instead, you know, we, sh we should be keeping food food. And, 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 you know, whether it's through CCS, whether it's through renewables, looking for ways um, to keep food food and provide our energy needs um, through, through other technologies. So we're not competing with uh, food supply. Okay. Okay, Tom, for your question, for your answer and address. Thank you for the question. Now we move to the next question, question number three. Yeah? From Mr. Mushofi Yahya. This question for Mr. Tom. Hi, Tom. I'm Mushofi from Pertamina. I have something to ask. Why do you consider CCS giving low contributions on two degrees Celsius path? I heard some countries see blue ammonia through CCS is one of pros prospective alternative. Yeah, uh, great question. And I, and I think you're probably reacting to that one slide where I had that waterfall and it, it, it really had a very, very small sliver of CCS. Um, I think we, we, we do think CCS is going to be a, an important technology in the U.S. Um, going forward for decarbonization. To meet the two degrees Celsius path of Paris, you don't have to go all the way to 100% net zero. And so as a result, we do think, and, and the chart I showed was just focused on the power sector. In the power sector, um, we generally find to get to 70, 80% decarbonization that, that can be done with a mix of um, renewables, battery storage, and, and gas, uh, you know, likely gas, hydro, and other uh, balancing technologies. Um, where we see CCS in the power sector and why you didn't see it on that chart, but where it will become important is if we want to go to fully to net zero. Uh, because to get to net zero, then we're going to have to uh, find ways of firm 
um, uh, firm generating capacity. And gas compared with CCS is, um, is, is one of the only viable firm uh, clean generating uh, capacities. Um, that all said, my chart only looked at power. Um, if we looked at other sectors uh, in the US, namely industry, um, which you know makes up makes up a mater uh, material part of the uh, United States carbon emissions. There, I think whether it's cement, steel, other industrial processes, um, or any place where, for example, steam is is needed, including the oil and gas industry, uh, there I think CCS is going to be an absolutely an important technology um, because um, burning and gas is one of those you know is, is a, or other uh, chemical and industrial processes that produce CO two. Um, you know, there really aren't any other alternatives. And so capturing that CO2 and sequestering it is gonna be the core way that industry and, and um, some of these other industrial processes uh, are decarbonized. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tom. Uh, is there any feedback from Mr. Mushof Yahya? Yes, thank you for, uh, for the explanations. Uh, no more question. Okay. Okay, we continue to the next question. Question from Mr. Hendrik Helico Servin. The first question The INR of renewable energy is slower compared to oil and gas energy. Will it be improving over time with the advancement of technology and change of policy? And the second question for Mr. Marco With massive resources of coal that Indonesia has, what is your view on how government should balance between the, the use of fossil and renewable energy in order to grow the economy? Maybe from Mr. Tom Baker first, and then Mr. Marco. Yes, sir. Yeah, on the IRRs, um, this is a this is a debate we have among our power renewables and gas colleagues in in BCG all the time. So th this is a fun this is a fun question. Um, I. The, it, it all depends on how you look at things. At a, and, and I think it's important when talk, whenever talking about IRRs is to talk about the risk and return profile associated with it. Um, what I showed in my slides were all project-based IRRs. And it's very, um, it is very true that oil and gas, uh, a typical oil and gas project has a much higher IRR than you see in, in, the, in the renewables business. But the risk and the return profile associated with those are very different. Um, as I alluded to uh, a few times, the risk associated with the utility scale renewable project is, is generally quite low. Um, you know the sun's going to shine, you know, the, you know generally the wind's going to blow, the technology is, um, is, is, uh, is well understood. And so we don't, you know, you don't see many renewable energy projects fail. Um, on the flip side, on the oil and gas side, obviously, as this group knows well, um, you know, projects that start with looking like a, with a great RR, all of a sudden uh, go, you know, get a lot worse when when something when something happens when um, there you know there's an issue with production, etc. And so, I think if, if the the most important question, why well, I showed the individual project is, you know, if you take a portfolio of projects and looked at the total cash production, you know, from the, a portfolio of renewable projects and a portfolio of oil and gas projects, what, you know, what would be the total cash generation associated with that? Um, and there, I, well, it still remains to be seen, but I think their, their returns are actually quite similar. Um, and of course, the oil side all depends on the price of oil. So at $30 a, a barrel, uh, the renewables probably win. Um, at $80 a barrel, uh, oil and gas probably wins. So, um, you know, there, of course, the commodity pricing uh, is a big, big driver of, of these returns. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Tom, for, for the answer. I, I just one uh, last uh, question uh, to follow up uh, your explanation. Uh, when, uh, when the oil and gas company transformed to a more renewable portfolio, uh, will it also... Um, make them uh, compete head to head with the uh, utilities companies. Uh, what is your, uh, your, 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 your point on that? In Indonesia, maybe uh, Marco can uh, elaborate uh, later. Can you uh, comment uh, on uh, that perspective between Pertamina and PLN? Thank you. 
Yeah, I'm happy to start. I mean, I, I think um, it remains to be seen. Um, I think we have examples of the oil and gas, the global oil and gas super majors who have done a decent um, shot, uh, uh, have been have done a good job of being competitive, then others have arguably failed miserably uh, as they as they tried to make the transition. So um, I I, you know, what's important, I, the, the businesses are very different. Um, and, you know, the, the, this risk return profile is an important key difference uh, between um, the two assets. And, you know, what I, where I often see oil and gas companies fall down is they, um, they're good at taking risk and they put things on their balance sheet and um, you know they 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 don't take on debt, and they you know they look to hold everything on balance sheet. Because utilities uh, utility scale renewables has such a low uh, return and is very safe, that develop and flip model that I described, and the 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 the, the need to take things off your balance sheet and either lever uh, lever up the projects or look or or be a lot more nimble and quick in development. Um, is um, I think very different between you know obviously from the traditional oil and gas uh, model and 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 one of the ways in which I think oil and gas companies need to think differently. Um, on the other end, I think the oil and gas industry knows how to manage large projects, knows how to do EPC, um, and you know um, knows how to manage uh, local politics and regulations, and those are all very. Um, important capabilities that are also needed in the renewable space. Maybe just one addition to <clears throat> to what Tom mentioned, which is extremely important, uh, which is this risk return profile and the different DNA in a way of the oil and gas and the utilities. Uh, oil and gas definitely had a different scale uh, compared to the utilities. And I don't know, 10 years ago, it was difficult to find a utility apart from a handful of that of them that had the global portfolios, which was comparable to Shell or to Exxon or to Chevron. Uh, what is happening with the renewables is basically that these kind of portfolios are becoming global. And let me give you one example. So you have this radical example of the transition uh, which Dong Energy did. So basically Dong Energy is a Danish oil and gas incumbent which 15 years ago made a decision to start transitioning into the renewables. And basically they did the transition all the way. So they are not in oil and gas anymore. And they are the largest offshore wind uh, developer in the world. Uh, offshore wind is interesting because it's a global play. And why Donk, which was rebranded to Airstead in the meantime, wants to have a global play? Uh, because of the scale. Because when you start scaling the investments in the renewables, you're starting to get the input variables uh, more and more affordable or cheaper, uh, basically, than to the investments in, in one country or in one territory. So uh, you have larger negotiation power when it comes to the buying of the equipment. You have lower work because uh, basically investors are interested in, in, in investing in you. And then on top of that, you have more and more effective EPC model because you are actually gaining experience. So this is a typical experience curve in which Airstead today can uh, actually make business cases uh, for, the, for, the, for the wind, which are better than any other investors. And then on top of that, uh, back to Tom's point, uh, build and flip strategies. So basically offloading from the balance sheet. So what do they do? They actually identify the business development opportunity. They construct a project uh, and then they start selling the project either in the, in the phase which is already constructed or in the, in the phase before the construction. But basically their business model is still to stay within, within the operations as the O&M provider. So basically they still continue to get the revenue flow from the asset, but without having the ownership of the asset on its balance sheet which actually enables the scale, because otherwise you will have a lot of capital which is locked in. Um, and that's why renewables are, are basically this fine balance. How do you, in these four models, four business models that Tom shown, how do you balance between these four models or even shift uh, across different phases of the project from one model to another one? 
uh, uh, but Henry, because back to your question on the PLN and Partamina and uh, and the comparison, it's a uh, it's 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 a tough question. So uh, uh, Partamina as oil and gas, which 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 actually has very ambitious transition plan, uh, is uh, is shifting quite a bit into the electricity. So through its subsidiary PPI, I mean, the plants are very, very ambitious, uh, both in the on-grid and off-grid uh, installations. And this is something which is very welcoming. On the other hand, PLN has different problem. PLN has a problem of the decarbonization of the electricity value chain itself. On top of that, having the responsibility, not only as a national incumbent, but also as a single buyer, basically to provide the security of supply. So you can imagine that um, this equation for PLN will have different variables than the equation for Partamina, uh, because the equation for Partamina will take a look into the decarbonization of the uh, oil and gas, so basically hydrocarbon value chain, but then also how to expand uh, uh, into, into the adjacencies which are power. In PLN, the situation is, how do I work almost on the patient which is in the, in the, in the operation and basically try to uh, do this transition without impacting the, the security of supply in, in Indonesia, but also without impacting my own profitability with these kind of shifts. Um, that's why for PLN, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it needs to be very carefully thought through what is this series of steps uh, which they need to go through. Thank you, Marco and Tom. Thank, Thank you, Marco, on, on, on your question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Okay, we continue to question number five from Imadi Abusiasa. Question to Mr. Tom. From your slide, I, I see that solar and wind are still the main focus of the renewable energy in the US. What about green hydrogen? Has US considered this alternative as well? What will be the prospect? Thank you. Yes, um, US uh, absolutely. I think um, we're seeing and increasingly doing more work and seeing buzz around green hydrogen. Um, in fact, the recent um, infrastructure uh, uh, two trillion uh, plan that the Biden administration announced just uh, just this week had uh, several mentions and extensive. Um, uh, introduction of subsidies for green hydrogen. So in, in short, um, I, I think the answer is yes. Now, similar to my answer to the CCS question, I think we'll see less. And, and by the way, the, you know, what's gonna drive the electrolysis for green hydrogen is, is likely gonna be solar and wind um, combined with, with battery storage. But I think um, similar to CCS, where green hydrogen is gonna be um, incredibly helpful is is not in the power sector uh, because again we're gonna we're gonna we can just use directly the uh, electrons from wind and solar, but um, the hydrogen produced by those technologies are gonna help other sectors like um, like industry and transportation uh, decarbonize and so we see um, uh, we see opportunities for um, hydrogen to be used in ammonia production to be used in production of uh, chemicals. Um, to be used in uh, a variety of chemical and industrial processes. We also see hydrogen in the transportation sector. Uh, for small and medium duty vehicles, you know, there we're likely gonna see EVs, but uh, hydrogen has a role to play for a heavier duty and uh, long distance transport. And so uh, long story short, yes, I, I think we'll see um, an opportunity for green hydrogen in the US, but apply to, to, to other sectors. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Tom. Any feedback from Mr. Imadi Agusiasa? Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Baker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Baker, uh, for, the, for the answer. Uh, I think uh, it has, in my perspective, my personal perspective, it has a bright future for green hydrogen because it has uh, some okay. advantage compared to other renewable uh, resources like uh, in storage capacity, right? So I hope uh, more and more we, we, we will go towards uh, these alternatives. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ingrid. Okay, thank you. 
the next question, question number six from Mr. Eko Plastio. Okay. The path to multiple forms of renewable energy is great, but what about the reliable of those? The popularity of fossil fuel-based energy is that it is reliable and long-running, whereas wind and, and solar are very climate-based, thus has less reliability. Also, both of those forms require batteries, which still have around two to three years of lifetime, which can add to investment costs and carbon, carbon trails of those solar and wind farmers. Also, alga, based, based fuel still hampered by huge use of water, which again add to carbon trails or footprints of that form of energy. What are the researchers doing so far to address the reliability and carbon footprints of those forms of energies? I think maybe I can do the first crack uh, from the from the Indo perspective, and Tom, Tom, please feel free to add. Uh, so, so indeed, solar and uh, and the wind are intermittent sources, and basically they they are working when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing. And when you take the definition of the renewables in this kind of narrow sense, uh, uh, basically in order to get 24/7 type of supply or the dispatchability or the dispatchable sources out of them, you need a battery or a combination with some kind of a base load source. Um, however, when you take a look into Indonesia, Indonesia has two renewable sources which are, uh, which are not intermittent. And this is hydro and this is, this is geothermal. Uh, so if you take this into equation, uh, especially into the equation which takes a look into the, into the volume of the electricity, uh, which is in the government plan, uh, basically we get a little bit different uh, different picture. The question is, of course, how do we stimulate uh, 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 hydro energy and geothermal energy, which are slightly more demanding in terms of the uh, both investment, but also the uh, skills or the capabilities which are needed from the developer side in order to build them. Uh, and happy to talk more about it. Um, in terms of the recent developments, so we had some situations in the Middle East where basically Middle Eastern developers uh, uh, tendered uh, the new installations which are 24-7 and purely renewable. So basically it's a combination of a wind, solar and the battery itself. And uh, what we have seen there is uh, because of the improvement in the battery technology, uh, primarily the density of the batteries and the drop in the in the in the cost these solutions are becoming uh, uh, quite affordable uh, and uh, uh, I think that we have one example in Australia as well of this kind of purely dispatchable resources so it's not a mainstream uh, combination yet but it's definitely a combination which is becoming more and more mainstream and coming back to the to the original hypothesis, the decarbonization of the energy value chain is not a binary question. So it's not something which will have a binary answer in which we are either uh, having a carbon footprint or not having a carbon footprint. It's a question of the evolution. And in this evolution, we will actually see the cost, the reliability of the technology actually being being approved. Five years ago, this kind of discussion would, especially in Southeast Asia, would still be very, very nascent. And we would probably be saying, you know, it's somewhere happening in the States, it's somewhere happening in Europe, but Southeast Asia is still far, far away uh, from that. Uh, five years later or today, we are actually seeing Southeast Asia at, 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 at the brink of this, of this, uh, of this uh, heavy penetration of the renewables. Any feedback from Mr. Eko? Yeah, that's an interesting answer. Uh, I agree that Indonesia has potential for geothermal and hydro energy. Yeah. And, but those two are uh, have potential, uh, what do you call it, uh, obstacle in, basically in social also, social uh, obstacle. Yeah. Especially the uh, what will change the ecosystem of rivers and of probably on a mountain forest. But if Indonesia want to step away from fossil fuels, we need to optimize those two resources. 
Also interesting that uh, Middle East wants to develop more of uh, solar and wind. Uh, what comes to my mind is uh, what about the sand problem in there? As we know that Middle East has many uh, deserts, so probably sand is a problem for them, especially to uh, uh, problem for photovoltaic solar cells. Probably uh, there is a, a new protective layers on the solar cells that prevent damage from sands or especially from sandstorms or something. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take this one. When I So um, before BCG, I worked in um, First Solar, which is a US-based uh, solar developer. And we had many uh, large utility scale installations in, um, in the Mojave and in, in Arizona, uh, where we also have similar sandstorms. Um, it's, it's generally not a problem. At the biggest issue, um, the, the, the systems are pretty robust and they can handle sand and wind up to 150 miles per hour. So we also see in areas of hurricanes, uh, the utility scale solar plants do fine. The biggest issue is if the sand collects on the, on the panel, um, you lose some of the production. So um, all we had to do was just go out and clean them um, every once in a while. Um, and, and uh, you know, with any of these technologies, uh, you know, there are, these are miles and miles. So you do have to be efficient in the way that you, you clean them and find ways to service them. And the major solar operators now actually have ro um, these little robots that are able to um, uh, automatically clean, go from panel to panel and clean, uh, clean the solar modules. Okay. Okay. Thank you uh, for the answers. Okay, thank you, Mr. Reko, for the question. Okay, we go to the next question from Mr. Emmanuel. For both uh, Dr. Tom and Dr. Marco, what is your opinion on entrance or chemical, re chemical recycling of plastics to hydrocarbons? Example, pyrolysis of pl plastics to fuel. When we're talking about renewable energy, I am aware that there are quick pyrolysis plants in the US and Europe, but I'm curious to learn what specific challenges exist when wanting to implement such technologies in Indonesia. Uh, Marco, I mean, I'd be curious your your take on the Indonesia specific piece. I, I, I can tee things up a little bit just to say that, um, you know, I, I also share the excitement around this technology. You know, the, the two biggest barriers, um, one of the biggest barriers to the adoption of paralysis is just the cost um, and, and how to be, you know, how to, the, the areas where it works in the U.S. and or Europe are where um, the end fuel is subsidized. Um, and so, to, to, because you typically see the end fuel uh, from a cost perspective, to be three to four times more expensive than than you know than the non-renewable version. So, and you know, costs will get better over time. But I think we'll um, continue to see a subsidy. Uh, another barrier in this market is, um, you know, obviously we have plastics everywhere. Um, that's not an issue, but the, uh, it needs to be cleaned and it, it needs to be sorted. Um, and depending on the paralysis uh, technology, there are only certain types of plastics waste that can be used. And so um, the cleaning, the sorting, the transportation of the plastics to, um, to where the facility is, um, in my experience, does end up to, they end up, that ends up being a major barrier uh, to, 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 to adoption of, of uh, plastics and fuel. Yeah, maybe, maybe just go ahead one, one, one thing here. So, um, uh, business case or uh, or economics of this kind of stories is is, is, is quite important, and uh, it's it's as Tom mentioned, it's quite expensive. So it, it it requires government subsidies, and what is important in all this process is actually to have a credibility of the of the process itself. Uh, we have seen in some other geographies outside of Southeast Asia, uh, basically a lot of government subsidies going into the processes which actually didn't result in the, <laughs> exactly lowering the waste, 
but basically the disposal of the waste or even export of the waste in some of the of the third world countries uh, uh, and, and just collecting the subsidies. So this is something what 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 really needs to be uh, what really needs to be addressed. Uh, considering that Indonesia has a big problem with the plastic waste and a big problem with the ocean itself, uh, sim similar to the Philippines, not as much as the Philippines, but similar to the Philippines. Uh, definitely, this is going to be one of the key questions, not directly related to the decarbonization, but related definitely to the whole ESG story. So the environment uh, and the social story uh, for the Indonesia in the future. But as said, uh, this is um, this is something what will require a, a, a detailed business case and a credible business case by the players which 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 intend to participate here. Thank you. Okay, thank you for Mr. Emmanuel. Is there any follow-up question or feedback? Okay, I think there's no follow-up question, yeah. So uh, it's 10 a.m. here in Jakarta, but we still have some question in the chat box. Is it okay for Mr. Tom and Mr. Marco to continue for two or three questions more? Yep, sure. It, 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 it's okay for me. Yeah, okay for me. Yeah, okay, sorry. No. I just, I, I guess I, I had a, I, I had a continuing question, but if we want to move on to the other uh, people's questions, I'm okay with that too. Yeah. Okay. So up, up to you. Yeah. Yeah, we could move on to the next question. But thank you, uh, Tom and Marco, for your response. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Emanuel. Okay, the next question from Imade Agusiasa. For Mr. Marco, in your perspective, what are the three main challenges faced by renewable energy development in Indonesia, and how should Indonesia solve it? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a million dollar question. <laughs> so I, I I would say I would say that uh, if I need to pick three, uh, probably three keywords would pop to my mind. This is uh, stability, uh, viability, and the last one would be the credibility. Let me elaborate each and every of the, of, of, of of those. So when it comes to the stability. When we talk to the to the investors, one of the main, especially foreign investors, one, one, one of the main questions which they ask us is, guys, can you tell us what is going on there? Because we have a feeling that the regulation is being changed uh, uh, every, every year or every two years. And for us, it's difficult to invest in something where we have a change of the, of the regulation along the way. And I mean, as you know, the quickest time to market uh, in terms of the renewables is solar probably uh, which is which is less than two years the longest one is probably geothermal which is like eight to nine years so we are talking about very very different time spans and usually very long time spans uh, so uh, I would say that a good uh, very clear and a stable regulatory plan or a regime that would hold for five or ten years would, would actually be quite beneficial. The second one is the uh, uh, business viability. So there was a question in the chat box which was related both to geothermal and to hydro. Uh, geothermal and hydro are a little bit different kind of renewables but are still the highest utilization or, or, or highest capacity factor renewable. They are not intermittent. Uh, and the second one is they actually require quite a bit of investment. And now the problem with both of them is actually what kind of input tariff you can get uh, from, the, from the PLN. So it's not a feed-in tariff, it's an input tariff. So it's um, a little bit tweaked approach. So we don't have a pure auction, but we have something what is a guaranteed tariff. And now we are coming back to the problem that PLN unfortunately has a regulatory cap and it's not able to go above the cost of its most efficient coal power plants in Java, which are the largest ones as well, which is quite low, which is about six to seven US cents. 
uh, per kilowatt hour, which is very low, especially for geothermal and especially for hydro, when you take into account the fully loaded costs. So if I'm the investor in geothermal or investor in the small type hydro, small form hydro, which is extremely important for Indonesia, I probably won't be interested in going into the whole project if I get a tariff which is lower than six or seven US cents. I can, but in that case, I need to have extremely low WAC and I need to have a complete security of my investment, which is not often the case in Indonesia. Uh, Mazda, for example, went as low as three US cents, uh, but I would say that this is more an, uh, an exemption than, uh, than, than, than something what would be a rule. And the third one is the credibility of the, of the whole system. So um, in Indonesia, as a huge country where we have a very complicated situation <coughs> when it comes to the coal, and when it comes to the reliance of the economy on the coal, we actually need to have a credible system how to uh, do the coal offsets. And this is a big topic, which is which is currently opening in Indonesia. <coughs> and I would say this credibility of the coal, of, of the of the of the carbon credits, and the whole market is is actually quite important because otherwise, um, if you have not credible carbon offset credits, and on the other hand, you want to get investors in the renewables, uh, but you have traders of the carbon credits which are not reliable and which are cheap you will get a market which is which is not an even playground for all the participants so once again uh it's uh, it's a stability it's uh, affordability or the or the business viability and it's a credibility and i think that following the examples of some other countries in the region uh we can actually uh do this uh, in indonesia it's just a question of the of the regulatory regime and the government uh um let's say assertiveness to push it forward. Okay, thank you, Mr. Barco. For Mr. Imadi Akusiasa, is there any feedback or follow-up question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Lakovic. Uh, I think this is the same issue um, for other kind of business in Indonesia. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, in your one more last question. Yeah. In your opinion, uh, with current government uh, or policy that has uh, that we have right now, do you think that we are in the right track, or we we are deviate, or we are still far from uh, from uh, well, a better Indonesia? <laughs> you know. Um, Thank you. I definitely think that the vector is right because the ambition is here uh, and the ambition is, uh, I, I mean, it's changing over time, but we are definitely talking about 20 plus uh, percent of renewable penetration uh, by 2030. Um, what, is, what is slightly missing is uh, basically how to put it into motion. So how to stimulate the participants in the market to start with the investments. And here, let's not uh, forget both the investors, where I think that they have actually financial stimulation through the VAT exemptions, <coughs> through, the, through the moratorium on the loans. But on the other hand, also the buyers of this electricity, primarily the single buyer, uh, which, is, which is the PLN. And I think that there was one question in the chat. And let me use that question also to answer your question. And this is, how do we take a look into the downsides of this transition, which is basically how do we address the, 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 the coal question? Because the coal question is something what we have seen in Europe, for example, 15 years ago, uh, related to the security of the jobs, related to the whole value chain, which is related to coal, which is definitely going to be impacted and disappear eventually uh, when we transit. And I would say that... Um, this leads to this um, interesting question of the energy trilemma, uh, which, is, which is important here. And this is, okay, we want to have a secure energy system, which is something where we are definitely going towards electrification of Indonesia made a tremendous steps in the past period. And we are talking about now 97%, if I'm, if I'm, not, if I'm not wrong, of the, of the, of the, last, of the last figures. Uh, how do we ensure the affordable supply 
Uh, and the last one, how do we ensure basically uh, a green supply or a decarbonized supply? And we call this energy trilemma because it forms a triangle. And this triangle doesn't necessarily need to go, these vectors don't need to go into, into the same direction. The question is, or the balance is, how to make them aligned. And uh, the question of coal is definitely the question which has a different trajectory than the question of the, of the, of the renewables. And let me try to answer here by, by answering that uh, it will be very difficult for any player in the market actually to get any kind of financial help or the support from the investors in the future if we are not talking about uh, decarbonized investment. So uh, we have a lot of contacts with the investors in Indonesia from the institutional investors uh, to, to, to basically corporate investors. So for example, banks are not keen in supporting the uh, 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 carbon footprint uh, uh, projects anymore, but are more than keen to support uh, green projects like geothermal projects, like renewable projects. So the climate is very different. On the other hand, the valuation of the companies which are relying on a carbonized value chain is actually going to drop. Uh, so now with the carbon credit market, uh, which, which seems to be something what is, what is now a nascent idea, but it's going to go into this direction, this is going to hit hard uh, the, the companies which have decarbonized value chain. So basically, uh, what you will be having in this equation is that your VAC and uh, your pressure from the state, so, so your cost of capital and the pressure from the stakeholders is going to increase. On the other hand, you are going to need to stimulate the coal phase out, which might be your revenue stream or the important uh, job security uh, element for the Indonesian government. And that's why this e equilibrium is important uh, um, in the future. Hope that this answers your question. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very broad topic, but uh, uh, definitely we have seen that it can be tackled. It's a journey. Uh, which doesn't happen overnight. It's a journey where Germany uh, went through the whole phase out first of the of the of the uh, of the coal, and then after that phase of the nuclear as well. Uh, uh, but um, this phase out has been the phase out over a decade or even more, and it's still continuing. Okay, thank you. The next question uh, from Mr. Helen Karyani. How to make geothermal business is more competitive with other energy sectors? Is there a specific business model and government program to boost the geothermal usage? Yeah. For both. Yeah, maybe I can I can I can do a first crack. So uh, I mean, geothermal is definitely a topic which is gaining a lot of traction. Um, we even had questions from the U.S. investors about geothermal, uh, uh, not only in U.S. but also in Southeast Asia. Uh, as one of the main markets in the in Indonesia and the Philippines. So the problem with uh, the the so the advantage of the geothermal is very clear. It's a renewable technology which is 24/7 and uh, which definitely is not intermittent like the other technologies. The downside of this technology is obviously that it's a, a, a complicated combination of uh, upstream and uh, and uh, power generation. This upstream part is actually what is not very favorable or what is not very appealing for the investors. And the main reason for that has been in the regulation. So basically, um, I don't know how, how much you're aware of the geothermal mechanisms, but there are 75 working areas in, in Indonesia. And basically when a new working area is being tendered for the exploration, the entity which gets a license to explore uh, needs to support the exploration in the first two to three years, uh, basically by itself, until the reserve is proven, and only then can actually contract the tariff with PLM. So basically, you are almost in the air as an investor for the first two to three years, not knowing exactly what is the size of the reservoir, and actually not knowing what is going to be your offtake price. Fortunately for the geothermal investors, this is now starting to be changed um, because the new uh, presidential decree is actually um, expected to increase the role of the government 
in the exploration. They call it government drilling, in which basically the government itself will have this burden of the proof uh, for the for the geothermal reserve, and then basically the tender itself for the investors will come only after the reserve has been proven, which is I think more even playground uh, for the investors uh, and also easier for PLN uh, to contract. So this is something what we await. Um, actually, it should be quite soon. People are saying that, that, that it's expected in the first half of 2021. And I personally hope that we will see the uptake of the investments in the geothermal uh, with, 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 with this. Uh, maybe, maybe just one addition. Uh, government also has two funds. Uh, so basically, the first fund is this government drilling fund, and the second fund is related to uh, offsetting or de-risking the loans which the investors took in order to explore. In the case that the exploration is not successful, so basically that the reservoir uh, capacity is not proven, which also in a way de-risks the ongoing explorations and investments in, in Indonesia. Okay, thank you. Is there any feedback from Mr. Ilan Kardani? Okay, if not, we continue to the last question before we end this discussion. Question from Putu Eka. This is a hot topic for us in Indonesia. In regards to 1 million BOPD and 12 billion staff per day by quantitative campaign we have in Indonesia, and considering less and less self fund or lender available for oil and gas, plus major shifting in investment strategy in some of major oil and gas, will this mean that the government of Indonesia most probably will need to invest majority of funds for the above state campaign from state budget, unless there is significant change in the investment regulation in oil and gas? Yeah, let me let me do the first crack. Um, so this is something what we have observed in the other markets as well. Um, so when we take a look at the transition plans of the oil and gas companies in Indonesia, you will see that these transition plans are uh, more similar to the uh, utility companies than to the oil and gas companies. So basically there is a huge interest uh, in these adjacencies. So basically how to explore the renewables, how to explore the geothermal, and uh, then on top of that, of course, how to decarbonize its own uh, value chain. Um, and this is motivated by the pressures from the from the uh, stakeholders, uh, mm -hmm. basically to reduce the carbon footprint, but also the pressures from the investors because it's very difficult to get the financing for uh, for uh, the non green projects. Um, so we are currently part of uh, green bond issuance for uh, for one of the of the of the companies in Indonesia, one of the SOEs. Uh, and uh, basically, um, in the discussions with uh, with the investors, uh, this is almost the only avenue that uh, the money can be approved for the for the uh, for the big infra projects. So yes, that means that uh, there will be a huge amount of money pouring in into the into the green projects. And now we have learnings from the other markets that we have the opportunity to implement in Indonesia. And I would say that the two are important. So first of all is the speed, and the second of all is credibility again. So basically when it comes to the speed, uh, you almost have frenziness about, uh, about renewable projects, uh, which, is, which is happening uh, in the world. So basically oil and gas companies are having so much money to invest that the problem is becoming in the supply of the projects. And here you see the spike in the uh, even in the in the licenses so for example the seabed licensing for the offshore skyrocketed uh, 100 times in the past couple of years <coughs> because there is actually not enough place because you know that the renewables ju just have a big footprint um, i would say that that's why the projection of or the roadmap in indonesia needs to be very clear in geothermal, it exists through the working areas. In renewables, um, it would be good to have transparency and the clarity. What is this roadmap in the photovoltaics, 
and in the uh, wind, uh, uh, basically in the next 10 years, so that we can avoid these spikes in the in the cost, and basically some of the players taking taking uh, advantage of that. So this is the first the first pitfall uh, which we need to avoid, and the second pitfall is basically the credibility. So one of the main things that the investors are warning us is how to avoid wrapping uh, an old project into the green wrapper and basically asking the asking the money for that because this is definitely not the way how we should proceed. Uh, if you are talking about decarbonization and uh, and the energy transition, we need to have true green projects. Uh, some people call it greenwashing. Some people call it credibility, but this is something what we need to uh, actually teach or or instill in uh, in the corporates in Indonesia to avoid this kind of pitfall which happened in some other of the in some other of the geographies or the or the countries. Thank you. Feedback <coughs> from uh, so, Marco, so what you're saying that is is going to be true then that the uh, related to the campaigns, back to my first question, basically, the campaigns that we have in Lee, we are slightly below 700 barrel oil per day, so it's a it's long way to go, basically. So, you will, from, if I might summarize your answer, will be it's more difficult. For the uh, for for the government of Indonesia to get investor to pouring their money for to achieve this objective of the campaigns, I would say then. Uh, it, it's definitely gonna be more difficult, uh, but there are investments which will need to happen, because um, as you might know, decarbonization is not the only critical element of getting the money. You have the social and the government and and, and the governance element. And this uh, social element is often tied to the security or to the uh, to the prevention of the of the disasters, uh, which is important. And unfortunately, we have seen this this situation in Partamina a week ago, uh, which happened in one of the of the refineries, um, which is actually related to the integrity of the assets. So this is still the area where we see the potential for the investments but definitely not in the expansion of the capacities, uh, which would be business as usual, like before. Uh, maybe the expansion of the capacity in terms of the biodiesel, yes, which is also one of the topics for Pantamina, and we are part of that story as well. But again, this is now the story which relies on the business case uh, more than on, okay, let's find any project to invest in. So I need to say that uh, green projects are important, but the underlying business case is important as well. Mm -hmm. uh, capital can be cheaper, but this doesn't make all the green projects uh, uh, economically viable immediately. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for, for a very interesting question. Thank you for the question. So unfortunately, we already at the end of the webinar. Thank you for Mr. Tom Baker and Mr. Marco for sharing your knowledge. And thanks to all the audience that joined from the beginning until the end of the session. And before we close the webinar and take some photo groups, let me convey some important points from Yami Talk today. There are four main business models in entering the renewable business, each with different trade-offs. Asia Pacific is massive and is becoming an increasingly attractive destination for investment renewable sector. For Indonesia itself, it has the precondition and key drivers for renewable growth, such as regulation, market penetration, and government targets. Okay, now we are moving on to the photo group session. Uh, Mas Oza, please help me to prepare it. And for the uh, all attendants, please talk, turn on your camera video. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please turn on the camera, please. Before we take up a photo group, we wait for two sorry. minutes. Yes, yes, yes. Know, sorry, I think Pa Andre Omer uh, recent. Yeah. Okay, uh, Mr. Andre Omer. Just, br um, just briefly, uh, I want to thank the presenters 
And uh, as I mentioned earlier in my uh, speech, in my discussion, uh, the discussion here until Paduri left uh, were all the private sectors and the academia. So I want to thank presenters for their views, Marco and Tom. Uh, a long way to go, a lot of ambitions, and even Pai Kaputu was saying a lot needs to be done. My role as the Consul General in Houston is to uh, uh, try and harness whatever collaboration we have. And um, I, I'd be grateful if uh, colleagues here could uh, channel your uh, comments also to the Consulate General so that we can we can harness your comments. Uh, one thing that's missing by Bintang is the role of the Foreign Ministry and the role of the Kemen Komarfes, yeah? Uh, if you uh, state to us regarding the role of Pertamina or SDM or even uh, MIGAS, um, uh, they, saw, they, all, they all have their uh, agendas, but I think Marco showed us that the, 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 uh, the, the, um, the, the tri, trilemma of energy uh, requires all parties, but I think the government needs to uh, really engage further. So I look forward to uh, working with you, Tom and Marco and everybody here, and I congratulate the organizers. Uh, we're ready to uh, try and find uh, some small step forward at Pabintang, yeah? Because if I hear the discussions here, Tom and Marco, um, we see the, the U.S. and even the state of Alabama is working extra hard to uh, stay ahead and even the uh, state of Louisiana. So if Indonesia is not going to have this discussion, Marco, next year, Pabintang, I think we might be in a bit of trouble. So whoever the next president will be, uh, I hope uh, your hopes uh, can be uh, uh, attained at least in some, some small percentage. But great presentation, by, and I look forward to working with all of you. Pandre, Thank you, thanks Sally. a lot. Pandre, thanks a lot. It was our pleasure to be part of this. Uh, also, Pahadi, Patona, Pahenrikos, Pabimo, Pintang. Thanks a lot for inviting us. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Okay, can we start for the photo group? Okay. Uh, there, there is two panels, so please your hold your post for a second. We have to take a photo for panel. First panel, please hold one, two, three. And the second panel, please hold the pose. One, two, three. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And thanks to all. And see you at the next Yami Talk. Happy weekend and keep healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much for everyone. Thank you, Mr. Marco and Tom. Andre, terima kasih.